Bernie Sanders is in the UK promoting his new book, It's OK to Be Angry About Capitalism. A new US senator dropped into LBC to speak to Andrew Marr. I don't have the exact statistics in my head, but we probably spend in the United States twice as much per person on health care. We spend $13,000 for every man, woman, and child. An outrageous sum of money. And yet we end up with 85 million people who are uninsured or underinsured while the insurance companies make billions and billions of dollars. The function of the American healthcare system, something you should not emulate here. The function of the American healthcare system is to make the insurance companies and the drug companies phenomenally rich. The goal should be, and it's not an easy goal, is how in a cost-effective way do you provide quality healthcare to all people as a human right? Not necessarily easy, but that's the goal. And it's a lot less expensive than allowing the insurance companies to get involved in order to profit off of the system. And looking at what's happening here, do you, do you see a risk that Britain starts to look at the American model and go in that direction? Do not look at the American model. Please do not. Build on what you have, improve what you have. Healthcare is a human right. That's what it is. And that was established here in, what, 1948. That was an extraordinary achievement. And I understand your system has problems. Deal with those problems. But don't think that insurance companies and privatizations are going to make the situation better. They will only make it much worse. But it's such a pro politician, because you could tell Andrew Marr's asking him, you know, and I'm sure you're following the debates on whether or not we should privatize the NHS. But it's like, got, do you really think I'm following what West Streeting or what um, the Tory health secretary is saying at this point in time? I'm just going to give a, my, my, my passionate answer, which is you do not want to do what we're doing. Keep your NHS. Um, but he was also asked about Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, I'm not saying he's the Bernie Sanders of the UK. Um, you're both very, very different politicians in many ways. But he was a very, very popular left leader who galvanized another yes. generation of people. They all came behind him. And he has now been absolutely pushed to the side of British politics to the point where he can't even stand as a Labour candidate in his own constituency. And I wonder what your reflections are on that. Well, my, I'm not going to get involved in Labour Party politics here. I don't certainly sure. know enough. But I do know... Corbyn. And I think, as you indicated, uh, here's a guy who inspired a lot of younger people for a new vision for society, a lot of working class people, and his willingness to stand up to big money. Uh, and I think that is worthy of a lot of respect. Do you think it's sad that they can't run on the same ticket, he and the current leader? I don't understand. I, I really don't uh, what's going on with Labour Party politics. But it does seem a little bit strange to me that somebody who's been in the Labour Party his entire life was leader of the party, brought, as I understand it, hundreds of thousands of people into the party, is now told that he can't run. But that's about my knowledge of Labour Party politics. Sanders then appeared on Global's News Agents podcast. Um, he was asked further questions about Corbyn. I think we are, Corbyn deserves an enormous amount of credit. Is I think in the UK and in the United States, a lot of people have given up on politics. I can tell you that in the United States, historically young people do not vote in large numbers. But you know what we have seen in the last number of years? We've seen that change. So not great numbers, but a lot more young people. And I think Corbyn deserves credit for energizing Whole bunches of young people working less people. So, so the Labour Party have said, look, you can't run as our candidate at the next general election. I mean, people listening to you will think you are a member of the Democratic Party. Yes. You stand as an independent. Would you counsel Jeremy Corbyn to do the same thing? Well, I'm not going to give Jeremy advice. He will make his own decisions. But, you know, I will say again, I, you know, I'm I, I, not involved in UK politics, don't particularly know much about it. I it bet just you seems know quite a bit. <laughs> well, it just seems to me to be a little bit strange that you throw a guy who was the former leader of the party out. You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It is a little bit strange. He's got that right. It is a little bit strange. Although you could sense he didn't really want to get into the nitty gritty of internal Labour Party politics. He is an extraordinary public speaker and it is not conveyed in videos. Doesn't capture it. Does not capture it. I've never seen a better political speaker in my life in the English language. Amazing. And the guy's almost 80. Um, he talks in a register and a tone that literally everybody can understand. He uses allegories and metaphors that everybody can understand. And he's constantly, virtually every single paragraph, inverting what should be seen as right-wing shibboleths or the common sense presented by conservatives. He inverts that and uses it as a weapon against them. I'll give you one example. 
So I was, uh, I was at a smaller event just before the main thing, and he was just giving a, a, a talk. Jeremy Corbyn was there too, with his wife, Laura Alvarez. And he said, we need to redefine the idea of criminality and who is a criminal. Because I think if you're a landlord and you're throwing a tenant out because you've just raised the rent, you're a criminal. I think if you're trying to lay off workers because they're on strike to earn higher wages, you're a criminal. And it was a really impressive experience because I just thought, you know what? You could go say that on uh, BBC Newsnight, Channel 4, LBC, GB News. You could say it's the Daily Mail, The Sun, The Guardian, The Times. It wouldn't matter. People would agree with you. And there's a real lesson there. And what it really confirmed to me, Michael, is the left populism. You know, we're going to talk about the, the popularity of Bernie Sanders as a politician in the United States. He is extraordinarily popular. He was the most, you know, the most popular politician in the country in 2017 and 2018. He still is. I think in terms of active politicians, he's the second most popular in the United States um, at the moment amongst those still around. You know, number one is Jimmy Carter, but he's getting on now. So what it really compounded and confirmed to me was that the power of left populism. And how actually, when it's done right with charisma and a coherent policy agenda, it's pretty much unbeatable. And there's a reason, Michael, why the establishment in this country, and by the way, that exists within the Labour Party too, is so determined to stamp it out and for us to forget the power of left populism. Because mobilised right, like I say, with the right policy agenda, with the right people, it can absolutely steamroll legacy politics and legacy organizations. And lots of people's careers, Michael, as we found out over the last, over the last eight years in this country, lots of people's careers, from consultancy to policy to politics to communications to journalism to punditry, lots of people's careers depend on legacy organizations, legacy politicians doing well. They don't want left populism around because on a personal level, it obstructs their own career ambitions. It's a very powerful thing, Michael. Let's not forget it.